Well, children, I have a question for you, as I often do at the beginning of a children's message. And that question is, what is the coolest thing that you have ever done in your dreams? in your dreams if you can remember what's the coolest thing that you've ever done in your dreams i'll tell you what the coolest thing i've ever done in my dreams is do you want to know oh good (laughs) that was going to be a little awkward if you didn't want to know um The coolest thing I've ever done in my dreams, and it happens to me pretty frequently, is I can fly in my dreams. It's true. Yeah. I I just, I, I can decide to fly up high, high in the air, higher than the clouds and everything like that. Or sometimes I'll just float along parallel with the ground but not on the ground and I can just or I'll I'll sometimes I'll I'll leap high into the branches of some tree and just be able to jump higher and higher until I'm flying anybody else cool things yeah go for it riding a unicorn nice nice Yes. <laughs> now, winning the Stanley Cup with the Toronto Maple Leafs, that is a dream. And, <laughs> and I hope someday you do it because, truth be told, it'll probably be the first time in a very, very long time if you do it. Yes. A dinosaur. A dinosaur? Nice, Izzy. he? Ooh, being able to turn into a mermaid whenever you want. Nice. Ro- is that Roman behind the mask there? Yeah, go, Roman. It's a secret. I forget. Okay, oh, that's fine. Anybody else? Adults, too? Anything cool you can do as an adult? Maybe you can play piano like an incredible virtuoso. Okay, so children, here's another question. What's the difference between the dreams that you have when you're sleeping and the hopes and dreams that you have for your future? Maybe you dream of becoming an astronaut or maybe you dream of becoming a teacher. What's the difference between those dreams and the dreams you have when you're sleeping? Is he? That was a great answer, Izzy. Thank you so much. The dreams that you have in your sleeping are, are often things that, that can't actually happen. But the hopes and dreams you have uh, for your life later on, those are things that maybe they can happen, especially if you work really hard and you put your mind to it. And that's good. Today, when we talk about scriptures, we are going to talk a little bit about those dreams that maybe seem like they're things that can't happen to large portions of the world, but they're actually things that are happening and will happen. They're the promises of God and how those dreams can be like a revelation to us. And so here's one of the things that people will often tell you, children. They will often tell you not to let go of your dreams. And when they say that, they're not talking about the dreams that you have when you're sleeping, although those may be fun to hang on to too. They're really talking about the dreams, the hopes, the desires you have for your future. Maybe a realistic dream like winning the Stanley Cup with the Maple Leafs. So, brothers and sisters, children, this morning, as we look at the Scriptures, try and think about the dreams that you have for the whole world and for yourself. 
Well, brothers and sisters, this morning we are going to be uh, sort of celebrating Epiphany. Epiphany uh, happened this past Thursday, but we'll celebrate it today. Epiphany is that time where we recognize specifically in the church calendar the, the revealing of Jesus as the Messiah. And usually at this time, we look at the visit of the Magi to Jesus because this is when the world leaders, uh, symbolized by the Magi, come and recognize the Messiahship of Jesus. So I would invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. We already heard during our call to worship from Isaiah 60. Uh, Isaiah 60, I arise, shine, for thy light has come. It is is partnered with Matthew chapter 2 in a lot of ways and reveals to us this reality of Jesus as the Messiah. Listen to what the Bible says. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard that, he, heard that, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. We need called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law. He asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied. For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then, Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. The word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, brothers and sisters, children, we have some things that we need to clarify here before we get too far into this message. Uh, first of all, we need to remember that the picture that we often have of the Magi coming to Jesus at the, the, uh, at the stable in Bethlehem is wrong. I'm sorry, it makes for pretty nativity scenes, but it's not correct. The reality is, if we pay attention to this passage, we notice that the star appears when Jesus is born. Not before Jesus is born, but when Jesus is born. And they, they come and they, they, they make their travels from the east. We, we notice that the east is, is the vague and general term that Matthew gives probably because these, these magi, these wise men, come from so far away that they don't have a name particularly for the country that they come from or anything. They're just from the east. It's like you're from the, west, from the east coast and you just say they're from away, <laughs> right? Right? These people are so far away. And so you can imagine, right? Remember in these days, uh, you, you don't travel by airplane or by, uh, by motorboat or by car or whatever. You're traveling by camel and by foot. 
And so these wise men from so far away, they see the star shining on the day, the night that Jesus was born, probably at the same time as the angels proclaim to the, the, the shepherds the reality of Jesus' birth. Then the star shines in the sky, and, and these wise men from far away, they see it, and then they have to make their preparations to go after they've figured out what it means. And, and preparations to go, you're talking like a whole caravan with servants and attendants and so on and so forth. So the picture of three lonely guys on camels is probably also not correct. It's probably a whole lot more people than that. And, and come to think of it, we don't know how many there were. There weren't necessarily three. There might have been three. We do know that there were more than one because it says wise men. The magi is plural. But we don't know whether it was two, three, four, seven, five hundred. We don't know that at all. All we know is that there were three sort of categories of gifts. We don't even know whether it was like one bar of gold or many items of gold or whether it was one package or a container of incense or many of them. We don't know any of those things. So I'm, I would say sorry for ruining your illusions about Christmas, but I, I, I'm not really sorry about that. So, so we have all these wise men and their entourage coming and making a journey. And, and here's another part of why we know that it was not that they came on the day that Jesus was born. Listen to what the Bible says. Verse 11 of chapter 2. On coming to the house they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Of course, the stable is not a house, right? It is further evidence that we know that Jesus was not in the stable still with his parents. This is actually the sequence of events. Jesus is born in Bethlehem. The star shines overhead and the wise men see it from far away and start figuring out what it means and make their plans. Meanwhile, eight days after Jesus is born, Luke tells us, eight days later, Jesus is as was appropriate and as was the law. Jesus is presented at the temple. For, uh, for his blessing and so on. And, and that's where we hear about Simeon and uh, we, we hear the words of prophecy over him, right? And, and, and then Math, or Luke tells us that after that, they go home to Galilee, to Nazareth. They go home to Galilee, to Nazareth. So Jesus and his parents go home to Galilee, to Nazareth, and they set up their home there. They live there for some period of time. And that is where the Magi find them, at their home in Nazareth. And this would have been maybe a year, maybe a year and a half, maybe two years after Jesus was born. In fact, we are told that when Herod hears that the wise men, the Magi, escaped without coming to them, he goes and he says, okay, we're going to kill all the children two years and under just to make sure, right? That's because Jesus could have been as much as two years old, right? And then shortly after the Magi visit Jesus and his parents, Joseph is warned to flee to Egypt. And then this is where the gifts come in, perhaps, right? Joseph, as a carpenter, wouldn't have been the wealthiest fellow around. And, and a journey costs money, no matter, no matter who you are and no matter when it is. And so there's a lot of thought among theologians and biblical scholars that basically the, the gold from these gifts was used to finance their, their journey 
to Egypt, their stay in Egypt, and their journey back home. And then you've got the incense and the myrrh. And the thoughts are that, that these things, which are uh, the incense is used in anointing, anointing of kings and so on and so forth. And the myrrh is used as part of the burial process. The thought is that perhaps when the ladies are taking care of Jesus' body after His death and embalming it for the grave, that perhaps the myrrh that they would have used for that would be this very same that was mentioned here. Now hopefully that clears up some of the details of the story and how it happened and when it happened. But what does it have to do with epiphany? Well, in order to understand that, we need to understand what an epiphany is. Is An epiphany is basically that aha moment, right? It's like when you're, when you're there and you know the stereotype of Eureka, I found it, right? Or in the cartoons when you've got the guy with the light bulb that appears over his head, right? Oh, yes, I've got the idea. I understand, right? It is that Eureka moment, that moment where something is revealed to you that you did not know before right there's a famous painter or there was for example uh whose whose name was salvador dali anybody familiar right he's the guy that paints those weird paintings with the melted clocks and stuff like this right he had this idea that the best way to keep his creative juices flowing was to sit in a comfortable chair like this one, well, except maybe more comfortable, with a heavy item in his hand. And he would doze off. And just as he was falling asleep, the heavy item would fall out of his hands and he would startle awake. And his idea was that that space between sleeping and being awake was the space where the magic of dreams and the reality of life met together and you could have the greatest ideas. And it sounds a little, a little cockamamie maybe, except that scientists recently did some studies about this and they got a whole bunch of people together and they put together all kinds of math problems that, for them to do. And, and there was a theme with these math problems and if you knew what the, what the solution was for one, if you knew how to use the same trick, you could solve all the problems really quite easily using the same trick. So. They had this big group of people, and some people knew what the trick was pretty much right away. So they got kind of eliminated, because they already knew it. But then leftover, you had a whole group of people who didn't know. And they encouraged them to either have no nap and just keep plugging away at it, or to have one of the dolly-styled naps, where you fall asleep and startle yourself awake, or they said have a nap for as long as you like. And the study showed that the people who had naps as long as they liked, and this was very sad for me to realize, the people who had naps as long as they liked did the worst. <sighs> there goes my whole philosophy of life. <laughs> but then the people who kept plugging away at it, who didn't have any naps, who just worked, they did, they did okay. They did okay. They plugged away at it, and they got it done, and it was okay. But the people who did the best were the people who had the Dali-style naps, where they just were drifting off to sleep and then startled awake. And something about that time gave them the epiphanies that they needed to figure out the problem. Brothers and sisters, it is so easy for us to choose one of the other two options in our lives. 
It is easy for us to stay awake and keep plodding along, to be aware of the real world and just keep slugging it out day after day. I'm not blind to the realities of life. I know what's going on. I'm a realist. Right? You can just keep slugging away at it. And maybe you can do good things. Or you can be like so many of us, you can put yourself to sleep for as long as possible and pretend that the world doesn't exist. You can immerse yourself in pleasures and entertainments. You can immerse yourself in unreality and pretend that this world is not full of sorrow and grief and struggles. You can pretend that everything is fine and that, you know, just live a life of hedonism or excess or willful ignorance, sleepwalking, through your days. But the reality of Epiphany is that the Magi who were known to be wise men, the Magi who were known to be wise men who knew the realities of the world around them, who knew about the sorrows and the struggles and the darkness and the wickedness of life, they also knew and believed in the dream of something better. They knew and believed in the dream of something better. Why else would they leave their far, far away countries, travel potentially two years to get to a child king of an obscure country on the coast of the Mediterranean? You see, they were living in the joined reality of dream and waking of hope and the day-to-day. They willfully chose to live in that space. And that is our call too. Because we are in the same boat. We see the brokenness around us. We see the brokenness within us. We see how I want to do good things, but yet the good things that I want to do, I do not do. And the things that I do not want to do, those are the very same things that I do, as Paul says. We see all of those realities, and yet we also live in the time of the revelation of Jesus Christ. The dream that is so much more real than any of the dreams we have when we are sleeping. The dream that is a strong, sure hope for our future. The dream that we cannot mess up by not trying hard enough. The dream that is given freely from God. And this is the tension of the life that we live in. The calling to live in the dream and in the day-to-day. And so, brothers and sisters, this epiphany, this year, this week, let us try to live willingly in that tension. The tension of the day-to-day. The tension of the the dark and the sorrowful and the struggling and the painful and the sick and also in the reality of Jesus, the reality of our adoption as sons and daughters, the reality of the truth that there will be a new heaven and earth where all things will be made right, the reality that we are not just Dan or Cole or Jane, we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. Because this is something that not only we need to live in, but it's also something that the world needs to hear. Right? 
Because just like us, the rest of the world is tempted to live in permanent dreamland or tempted to live in permanent realism or to switch between those two without ever getting the reality that there is the perfect epiphany blend of the day-to-day and of our Lord Jesus Christ. So brothers and sisters, whatever, whatever realities you're dealing with, whether you're on a farm and COVID is not making particular day-to-day difference for you, or whether you're working in a healthcare or factory setting where 40% of your colleagues are gone on any particular day and your coworkers are stressed out, or whether you're in some situation in between, whether your stresses and sorrows have nothing to do with COVID, or whether your joys and temptations are things that are, <laughs> that are not healthy or good, wherever you are, come back, come to the place of wonder, living in tension with the everyday and the real. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so very much for your son, Jesus Christ, and how you revealed him to the Magi. Thank you, O God, that they can show us how it is possible to live in both the hope of the dreams that we have, dreams that you gave us, dreams that are more sure and more real than any waking life could be, and yet also living with the realities of our everyday existence. Lord, help us. Help us to be epiphany people. People who live in the wonder of that constant tension and reality. Lord, guide us that we may give hope to those around us Hope for a future in your name and through your power. And hope for today through your spirit and through your word and through deeds that you inspire us to do. Lord, may we acknowledge and give our gifts to you each and every day, living in this truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.